There he is, the man himself. <laughs> must be Aaron from Lulu's Perch. Tis <laughs> <Is> I. <laughs> All right. Hey, come on in. Let me show you around. This is something to show you. Waking up at the crack of dawn. Down with dog and the tractor's on. I'm checking them chickens. Got eggs in the kitchen. I'm picking them pickers for a patch of lawn. First, do a YouTube search. Take some time and loot from work. Get your boots in the dirt and a scoop of earth. Then head on over to Lulu's Perch. <laughs> Welcome back guys for another episode of Lulu's Perch. You're in for a treat because I'm about to fly directly into the heart of the Middle East, into Jordan, Amman, to go visit the one and only Jeff Lawton at his Green in the Desert site. It's going to be incredible. I'm going to be there for a one month internship. I'm going to visit Petra, Wadi Ram, the Dead Sea, and I'm going to learn how to bloody grow vegetables in the middle of the desert. It's going to be crazy. Let's jump on a plane. Let's go. I made it to Amman in Jordan for Jeff Lawson's internship, the Greening the Desert Project, the man and the documentary that got me set out on this permaculture mission. And I've had a fantastic time in Amman so far. I've been to the markets, I bought heaps of food, I got invited to a locals place. And despite the language barrier, there was a the universal language of food and football that broke down all the communication barriers. So that was a fantastic time. And I am really looking forward to, and I'm super excited for the Greening the Desert project. I'm gonna catch a bus and I'm gonna head out of here. Let's do it. So for anyone who is unfamiliar with who Jeff Lawton is, He's arguably one of the best permaculture teachers in the world, and he's the managing director of the Permaculture Research Institute in Australia. With a portfolio of international projects, TED Talks, and online courses, he has designed food growing systems that have been implemented all over the earth and can alleviate starvation, recycle water, save species, reduce pollution, and with the rapidly declining health of the global environment, could potentially save the human race. So this is what Jeff and Nadia's Greening the Desert site looked like when they arrived. It's dry, it's rocky, and it's so close to the Dead Sea that this pretty much has the pH level of table salt where nothing survives, not plants, not even animals. And as, as Bill Mollison described it, it's basically the moon. Now in Jordan, you get a block of land if you get married. You can only hold on to that land if you build a solid concrete structure on. Everyone builds one, but nobody actually lives in them. However, when Jeff and Nadia came to their property, they lived in theirs much to the amusement of their neighbors and turned their block of land from that rocky, sandy soil into a shady oasis. But before they could get food and abundance, they had to create a system. They had to divide that site into five main sections. One being the nursery where we plant all the seeds and we get all our shoots. The shoots then go into the vegetable garden and the food forest. And all our food scraps and all of our leftover resources get taken to the chickens who compost it and turn it back into soil for the nursery. And the fifth and final is the straw bale buildings that house all the people that keep this process going over and over and over. But let's go and meet Jeff. He's about to start a permaculture tour now. Let's tag along and find out a little bit more. There he is, the man himself. <laughs> must be Aaron from Lulu's Perch. Tis <laughs> <His> I. <laughs> All right. Hey, come on in. Let me show you around. This is something to show you. We'll show you something special here. Give us a look. 
you want species list? Boss? <laughs> you want a species to count? Like, do you want me to name species? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah? All the way? All right. Arkansonia Jerusalem thorn, local legume tree, pioneer tree of the area. Leukina, lots of leukina on the site. Um, all the trees at the top of the property are obviously smaller than the ones at the bottom because most of the moisture goes down there. Albizia lebec, one of the great overstory legumes of dry climates. It's a long-term legume, It'll be a large tree in the end. There's a few of these, still putting a few in. So um, they're, they're one of the big canopies of the future. Neem, lots of neems on the site, um, grow well in dry lands. Acacia farnesia, perfumed acacia, uh, native to parts of the Middle East and Africa. Uh, carob, small carob, there's a larger carob lower down. Remnant prosopus in the corner, uh, there's two left there. I do think they're the last two on the site of any size, so we're almost nailed it. We'll probably take those as well in the end, so there's hardly any spiky marks here. And mostly will be Leukina, and maybe we'll hopefully get some Sesbania as well, which we just started planting again. Uh, our uh, major legume and nitrogen fixing, it's not a legume, but it's a, it's a nitrogen fixing and phosphate fixing tree. So mycelium fungi and Frankia bacteria, mycelium fungi fixing phosphate, Frankia bacteria fixing nitrogen. This is a Tacoma. This is a Tacoma Stands. It's a tropical honeysuckle, um, weed of the world. Uh, they'll grow right at the equator in the Amazon and right out into the Sahara and places. So they've got a long stretch. False olive, Dodonia, uh, one of the incredibly hardy trees of dry lands. Um, and when you, again, when you cut it, it recovers very well and gives you a lot of organic matter. Very last acacia, I think, on the site, uh, Acacia saligna from Western Australia. Um, the thing with acacias is most acacias, if not all acacias, when you cut them, they don't regrow. Uh, a, a hibiscus tree of uh, Australian subtropical shoreline. We're in subtropics by temperature. Um, and this grows on the, on the beaches of... Uh, Eastern Australia in the subtropical zone. Olive, lots of olive. Tamarisk, one of the great salt tolerant trees of the world. Volunteer here, indicated the soil is extremely salty. In fact, if you just go like that and lick your lips when you're in the dust of it, you'll taste salt. Or if you go like that and you want to lick your hand, you'll taste the salt. It's a, it captures salt and then bonds it up and then modifies it over time as it drops its leaves and drops its body eventually nature's in no hurry and then it um, it can be used to desalt landscape most people hate it because it's an indicator of um, salted land so they just look at it as uh, the symptom is the enemy but it's not the, uh, the symptom is the is the solution to the cause of the problem well, there you have it, guys, a comprehensive species list of all the pioneer plants that we can use to re-green any desert. No excuses. Next episode, we're going to be looking at seed bombs. We're going to seed bomb the Middle East. It's going to be great. Try get outside, plant a couple of pioneer plants for the kids, and I'll see you in the next chapter. Catch ya. My footwear, I flip flops, I'm sun safe, I slip slop, slap on a beat, it's hip hop, irrigation on drip drop, them caterpillars go get gut, I won't chip and aid, chip chop, pineapple dice like Rick Ross, my produce tip top. <laughs>